is that about 33,000 years ago, um, the whole of Britain is in the grips of an ice age. Um, it starts off in Scotland and moves further south. By about 23,000 years ago, um, this ice is at its maximum extent. At that point, it's not gone all over the whole country. And one of the key features to know about anything to do with the Ice Age is that when we talk about it, you'll often hear people talk about the last Ice Age. Well, the last Ice Age varies depending on where you are. So if you're in northwest Herefordshire, the last Ice Age, certainly the one with the great big towering cliffs of ice, much like these lovely ones you can see in the picture, um, actually happened about 23,000 years ago. But if you lived, uh, as I do, somewhere near Tewkesbury or even just Hereford, that's actually the towering cliffs would have been what you looked at, but you're now on permafrost, you're not covered by ice. Um, still mammoths wandering around, but they're not digging their way through sheets of ice. Uh, it's very cold. Um, for all of England, the majority of it, the last ice age was actually something much closer to 450,000 years ago. However, we're going to ignore all that. That's because glaciers act like a great big bulldozer. So as the ice moves forward, as it powers forward, it just pushes and grates and scrapes and crushes everything it passes over. As you can imagine, this has quite a big impact on what's left behind as it retreats. So as these glaciers spread out and push forward, they plow through, they churn up, they grate, grind down the landscape. Um, and what we had here is some big glacier coming down from the Welsh mountains. It starts off in the Welsh mountains, they're high up, that's where ice will start to form, and they spread out coming eastwards. And they make it about as far as the A49. And what happens is, as they come down from the mountains, they reach the comparatively flat Herefordshire countryside and spread out, forming these big lobes. These are known as Piedmont glaciers. These are modern ones, but it would have been something very, very similar to this. So what actually gets left behind is Hummocky Moraine. This is the landscape that I'm guessing many of you are familiar with. That ice is retreating and as it pulls back, it doesn't have quite as much energy and everything it's ploughed through, it drops um, and just leaves it behind. It creates quite a lot of different landforms. But the big one you see in Herefordshire are these wonderful rolling soft mounds, which we call hummocky moraine. A moraine is a type of deposit left behind by a glacier. And the hummocks are, as they say, they're little rounded bumps. If you ever want to know when you're out and about, is this a hummocky moraine? What you need to think about is, and I realise this is an odd description, is a basket of eggs. So you've got random round bits with little hollows in between. They are random, they're not lined up. Um, that is an important note. Uh, so these random little humps and hollows. I don't know if you can see, but right in the center of the screen is a tiny little red dot. That's actually a person just to give you a scale. Um, uh, and you can see sheep in the very distance. And these rounded hollows are what's being left behind. It's everything that glacier has passed over. It'll also be leaving behind if I scraped back that grass underneath I will find a real hodgepodge, a mixture of sands and gravels and clays. Um, we used to call it boulder clay because it was clay with boulders in, which is quite descriptive, but unfortunately for geologists who do like renaming things, not quite accurate enough. So what we've got now is these round hummocks covered in grass. That's thousands of years of time passing and then being gently farmed. So. The key features you want to know is where would I be to look at this lovely hummocky moraine. Uh, this image focuses on the stippled grey areas you can see are hummocky moraine. The bright red lines are showing you what we call a terminal moraine, which is as far as that ice lobe spread. So that bulldozer pushing forward, grating over everything, got as far as it could, and all that piled up stuff in front gets left behind as a little mound. Uh, known as a terminal moraine, and then it starts retreating back. That little mound is how we know how far the ice came. Uh, in this case, as you can see, it's a north-south line, pretty much matching up with the A49. Not quite touching Hereford, Lempster would have been covered. Um, you'll spot a second line, that's because glaciers, with everything, it's quite hard to imagine how they work, 
the best description I can give you is they're a bit like a conveyor belt and a bulldozer mixed together. So the bulldozer is scraping over everything and the conveyor belt is moving that stuff to the front of the glacier the whole time and just bringing it forward. As it retreats, although the bulldozer is no longer plowing forward, that conveyor belt is still moving all the material. It's grinding over to the front. And so it doesn't retreat it's straight in and out. And Hereford has the distinction of being a really fast moving glacier. We've done quite a lot of computer modeling has been done by various departments and universities. And they reckon that at its peak about 22,000 years ago, the ice was moving at about 500 meters a year. That's fast enough that you'd have seen it. If you'd stood still, you'd have started to notice it. Certainly you wouldn't want to pitch a tent in the nearby location because it might just disappear. I mean, that yeah. is really quick. But when it retreats, it's not all in one go. It would have st stood still and then moved a bit and stood still. It is going back, but not in a smooth motion. And what we see for these are what we call secondary moraines. Uh, and around Norton Cannon in the middle, you can see a little red line. That's what happens is your glacier is no longer moving backwards, but the conveyor belt action is still bringing stuff to the front. And it gives us a little hummock um, that you can see here. There are actually several we find, but it's those hummocks and deposits that help us know where the ice has been. The stippled areas you can see uh, here, kind of in a, a line along this river, the River Arrow, again down the River Y, and this new and hugely exciting geologically bit here around Pembridge and Wedley um, are the three main areas where we find hummocky moraine. The reason we like hummocky moraine is because where you find hummocky moraine, you find ice age ponds and kettle holes. As a result, it's these stippled areas that we have focused most of our effort on. So let's look about what ice age ponds and specifically kettle holes are. So how does a kettle hole pond form? As I mentioned, the glaciers whizzed forward at high speed from the Welsh mountains and ploughed everything in its way. Um, as it starts to retreat, bits of ice are left behind. Um, they're just, they're no longer attached to the main bit of the glacier. The glacier carries on retreating, these bits of ice are just sat. Because the glacier is still bringing stuff forward, there's lots of dead <laughs> bits of clay and sand and gravel, and they bury that block of ice. The ice is now buried, covered, glacier still retreating, and it gets left behind. So here you can see buried block of ice covered in sediment. That ice, glacier is now long gone, is there, slowly melting. Although it's warmed up enough that our glacier is retreating, it's not actually hot. This is still permafrost territory. So over the next hundreds and thousands of years, we certainly know on the cases they've been dated, unfortunately not in Herefordshire, that some of these took well over three and four thousand years for these blocks of ice to melt. Um, as those bits of ice slowly melt, they leave behind a hole. A depression forms because it was here and as the ice melts, the ground just caves in underneath. And it's those depressions we get, the mounds of the bits left on the side and the depressions are ponds. They form slowly over time and where we get ponds, we tend to get a buildup of um, organic matter and this sometimes, not always, but quite often forms peat. And uh, peat is really exciting. So what do these actually look like today? Well, if you were in places like Iceland, you get a fresh kettle hole if you like. They're not exactly uh, like this in Herefordshire, but they do vary in size. We've got a, a lovely person here uh, for scale. This is a small kettle hole. That's a little block of ice that's been buried. Um, because this is Iceland, it's worth noting, it's a lot warmer than it was in Herefordshire, so the ice melts quickly, um, and it's black, which also speeds up the ice melt. That's why you've got these very bare ground, it looks a bit volcanic, but you do get a nice impression of your mixed boulders and sediments. What we get in Herefordshire are these much more rounded hummocks, and then these hollows in the middle. Across Herefordshire, quite a lot of them are surrounded by trees. You get a nice little copse of trees in a little hollow, that'll probably be a kettle hole. Um, these Ice Age ponds are the ones we're really excited about. 
because mm -hmm. that shallow, which has taken probably several thousand years to slowly form, has then been around for, as Dave said, anywhere up to 18,000 years. So those natural ponds have been somewhere things can live for a really long time in our landscape. I just to, as Dave said, possibly provide a little bit more accuracy. I don't want you to think that these are the only types of Ice Age ponds there are, or indeed the only ones we're interested in. We do have some others in Herefordshire, not just one type, we have three. So we get this one. Oh, I've gone two slides in a go. Um, we get this up picture. This is the Sturts Nature Reserve. I don't know if you're familiar with it. What you wouldn't say is it's hummocky. It's in fact incredibly flat. That's because this is a glacial lake bed. You would have had that great big glacier and then in front of it a big flat body of water and then as that glacier um, is feeding ice in, you get icebergs. It's the kind of classic image of Northwest Canada area where you've got an iceberg floating. Only this lake isn't very deep and those icebergs would get grounded on the bottom because it's a lake and it's got a glacier feeding in, lots of sediment buries the bottom of that iceberg. And over time, the ice, both the glacier melts and warms up and the ice will melt. Water surrounding it would have been a lot warmer than the ground in permafrost, so the icebergs melt quickly. What this gives you, although I promise this picture is deliberately not showing it you, is all of this foreground here, which doesn't look at all like a pond, is a pond. It's just a very shallow pond that's only around for a short period of time, three or four months in the wettest period. So although hummocks and kettle holes are what we talk about a lot, there are other types of Ice Age ponds that are equally exciting, although slightly different. We also get a, a better example of that. You get lots of Ice Age ponds together, which is one of the reasons they're so exciting ecologically because an isolated pond can be a bit lonely for various creatures. But if you've got an area with lots of potential ponds, that's much better. So this picture in front of you, you can see this particular field here. Um, this is near Letton again, it's not very far from the Sturts. And you can see this field with all these humps and hollows. When you're on the ground, it looks as flat as the previous picture, but a little bit of water comes up and you can suddenly start to really spot these shallow depressions, um, creating lots of ponds. This is taken at a time of flood, obviously, but in winter they come up as well, just naturally. So uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about Ice Age ponds later, but hopefully Dave will help explain why they are so exciting. So over to you, Dave. Okay, thanks, Beth. <clears throat> so, as I said, um, so you've, you've got a little bit of the information about why kettle holes and ice age ponds are so important but here's a load of other reasons <clears throat> one of the first one which we've mentioned before is that they represent an ecological and geological ecosystem which has survived that long for up to 20 up to twenty thousand years for 18 to be more accurate um so that provides that in itself um the stability that 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 um habitat is provided is, is important in itself. Um, I sometimes think of them as, as a bit like ancient woodlands in that those are stable habitats where a certain number of species are able to have survived for many, many millennia. Um, so their distrib the, the distribution is very restricted um, and they're only found in very few parts of the country. And one important uh, thing to note is that um, in the rest of lowland Britain um, only 2% of ponds are of natural origin but when you come to the northwest of Herefordshire that figure goes up to about 25% so the mere fact that we've got so many of these natural ponds is an important feature in itself. Um, what we're finding and what has been suspected for many years and with, this, with the surveys that we're doing now is is bearing this out is that they have rich species assemblage assemblages which um, which include quite a lot of, of uh, rare and protected species. Um, as we've seen already the the, um, the density of the ponds and the number of ponds that you get very close together is, is another important uh, feature because that uh, provides um, a much more resilient um, sort of habitat and, and 
uh, series of habitats for all sorts of different species, particularly the the, uh, the amphibians like great crested newts, which rely on having several ponds of, at different stages, some of which can uh, produce young, some of which don't, and they they they, they can um, if if there are if the habitat's wrong, if there's fish in some ponds, then um, obviously the the the, the great crested newt can't survive because the fish tend to eat all the eggs. But in uh, and ponds which dry out on a regular basis, fish populations don't tend to build up. So they provide, they're the ones that are really good to provide breeding habitats for great crested newts and the like. Um, the other thing that's important is that um, Ice Age ponds are, are endangered. Um, because they're getting fewer and fewer, and particularly in the, the second half of, of the 20th century. So many have been filled in and lost. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about that later. So this is a, another typical Ice Age pond, probably a kettle hole, up probably near the, near the Pembridge area, isolated. There's no stream going into it, no stream going out of it, out of it and it's in that hummocky moraine um, landscape that Beth pointed out. This is um, an example from uh, the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust uh, Reserve at, at the Sturts, um, uh, Sturts East, um, and there are one or two really nice examples of, of Ice Age ponds and, and kettle holes that were formed, as Beth was, was uh, talking about, in the, the bottom of, a, of an Ice Age lake, so it's very flat, and there are many, many of these Ice Age ponds scattered around. This is a, a, a pond um, that we've been doing quite a lot of work on, and Will Watson, the project ecologist, is particularly keen on it. Um, the lawn pool at Mockers Park, which is on the edge of the, the Wye Valley. Um, and this is a particularly good example of, a, uh, of an Ice Age pond, not a kettle hole, but this one was formed in underneath a glacier when, when uh, water was moving at, at great pressure and, and speed and scoured out these areas. Um, so they, they were formed at, at roughly the same time, but they're in a slightly different way. But because of their longevity, they're still very important and have a wonderful array of species. One of which is this, um, this isn't actually, I, well, I've been pointed at, one, one of our colleagues is very keen on this. This isn't a medicinal leech. This is a uh, closely related um, species called Herodia um, uh, uh, verbana rather than medicinalis, but very similar. And they live in a very similar habitats. The medicinal leech is incredibly rare and Mockers Park, or well, the lawn pool was the only place in Herefordshire where it's been recorded in the last 20 or 30 years. And Will Watson found that a number of years ago. In the same pond, uh, this is a, a very rare water beetle, Grathodera cinereus, that Will has found. Uh, again, that's only been found, I think I'm right in saying, in, in the lawn pool at Mockus. Mm -hmm. Just very close to um, the lawn pool, just down the road, this, this is um, Agabus undulatus, and this was found actually it, during the surveys of last year. It hadn't been found. This is new to Herefordshire, this one. And the, the ecologists got very excited about this. The nearest population of this one occurs on the other side of Cambridge. So it's, um, it's a long way away, very isolated. Again, there are, there are Ice Age ponds in Cambridgeshire. Um, but this is this is the only example of um, of this species in in Hereford, Herefordshire, and it's it's an indicative of the fact that these these ice age ponds are, are really quite special in terms of the species they support. This is an interesting beast. If I only saw this um, this slide in the last couple of weeks, and um, Giles King Salter, who's one of the the project ecologists, has been founding finding it in in great numbers in, um, in, again, they found it at, um, at Blakemere, very close to, to the, um, to Mockers Park. Heliphorus strigifrons, and um, it's the grooved water scavenger beetle. Um, it doesn't normally look as shiny and smart as this, uh, as this, and um, Giles spent a long time very carefully cleaning it, and they're, they're characteristic in that they usually go around caked in mud. Um, 
So uh, not a very glamorous beast until it's cleaned up like this. Um, and but nevertheless an important part of the, of the pond ecosystem. That's about, that's about four millimeters long that one. You'll all be familiar with the great crested newt. <clears throat> um, as we've said before, um, ice age ponds because of their, their proximity to each other and the differing uh, drainage characteristics, very important for populations of great crested newts where they occur in, in, in groups. Another species uh, um, plant this time, which is characteristic and seems to be restricted to these ice age ponds, this is tubular water dropwort. <clears throat> and this is, um, seems to only be found in, in these natural ponds of ice age origin in, in Hereford, Herefordshire. <clears throat> Another rare plant for Herefordshire, this is bladderwort, amazing little plant. It's actually a, a carnivorous plant because it, it catches water fleas underneath the water in these tiny little bladders. Here, these are the roots that float freely in the water and they have a little triggering mechanism which sucks in water, be water fleas and digests them. And it has a lovely, when it's, when it's abundant in, in numbers, the, those yellow flowers actually cover the water. It's a very spectacular looking plant. Very rare though in this part of the world. These are, it's not just the, the, the sort of constantly watery bit, uh, the wet bit, as, as, um, as we were saying, it's the, the Ice Age ponds are characteristic in that they go up and down and they have what's called a, a drawdown zone. And some species are particularly um, uh, 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 um, confined to those uh, habitats. So orange foxtail on the left here and the slender spike rut, both of which are really quite quite rare in this part of the world and have been only recently found in in these um in, in uh, habitats next to ice age ponds not forgetting the the sort of less glamorous species but nevertheless very important parts of the ecosystem mud snails the ecologists get very get very um uh, excited about these um and this one was found in the um Dirt as well, again, lovely picture by Will Watson. But this is this is quite a, a this is a vulnerable species. So, so, to, so that's the reason. Very quickly, if if you want a uh, a more uh, um, detailed description of the ecology of ice age ponds, I recommend you ask Will Watson to come and do do you a talk. He does a wonderful talk. Um, with wonderful photographs and it'll tell you a great deal more about the, the interest of, of ponds like these. So to focus more on what the project um, needs are and what we want to do in the project, um, talking now a little bit about pond losses. So this is quite a recent uh, loss uh, in the, uh, certainly in the last decade, where somebody was illegally uh, dumping um, uh, waste, inert waste, and using a, a, a very valuable ice age ponds to to uh, taking money from people to get rid of waste, uh, and that was a very sad uh, loss of that particular pond. I'm glad to say I think the owner got prosecuted for that. These two pictures are taken at the same place. The one on the left was pro is I think an RAF picture during the uh, the 40s and it shows this field here which is exactly the same as this field here can you see my my cursor outlining here so that's what the pond looked like in the 40s and 50s probably unimproved grassland with a with a mosaic of, of ponds this is what the the field looks like today it's been um <clears throat> it's been plowed all the depressions have been filled in and it's a very uh, no doubt very productive uh, wheat field or cereal field, but this has happened um, throughout the county um, and has led to a huge uh, percentage loss in, in this particular habitat. Mm -hmm. So the project and the reason Beth and I are, are working hard to, to uh, do this, um, both last year in, the, in de the development stage, we were actually preparing the ground, if you like, in a relatively short period of time to carry out um, the work that we're doing now. But a lot of the work has overlapped. 
for instance, um, we recruited um, and trained uh, up to, uh, around about 56 volunteers. So we had 56 volunteers coming to four training courses. Um, and Beth and uh, Will and Giles talk, told them how to, to carry out surveys. Beth will be talking about a bit more about that later on. Um, we have prepared a conservation strategy, which we'll be sharing with uh, landowners and, and farmers in order to try and maintain, uh, to try and give the best advice on maintaining the, the, the rest of pond, the Ice Age ponds. Um, we've surveyed sites, more about survey, surveying sites and desk-based desk and ground surveys. Um, last year we held a stakeholders meeting where we invited a number of farmers and landowners and um, um, people from statutory bodies to come along and learn a bit more about Ice Age ponds. Um, the team have prepared uh, 15 management plans for, for selected ponds and I'll talk a bit more, more about those. We've prepared um, costings uh, and, a, and a business plan basically for this part of, of the, 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 um, the project, which is what gave us, is what convinced the lottery to fund the rest of the project. And that, that was as a result of submitting the application in, in August of last year. So Beth, the more, so tell us about the, um, what you've been doing as well, Beth. Um, one of the exciting things about this project is all the different sources of information that have come to light. As Dave said right at the beginning, um, there's a lot of information. We know that Herefordshire has about 25% of the ponds are natural, but it was all a bit guesswork. We didn't really know where they were. A lot of our information was based on the fabulous work of the Heref Amphibian and Reptile Trust and the Wildlife Trust and their knowledge of where ponds were. Um, and we were able to bring together quite a lot of different sources of data, which has suddenly made us go, wow, there's so much more to this and so many more ponds. Um, so we've used a whole host of different sources of information. The image on your screen now um, is actually a LIDAR data, uh, image. Um, this is very James Bond. It's lasers from planes. Um, it is as simple as that. The laser bounces down, hits the ground, bounces back up, uh, and it records the time that takes. What this does is give you an incredibly detailed uh, surface topography without any of the greenery and buildings really getting in the way. Um, and this really has helped. And when I say detailed, this is down to sort of 10 centimetre resolution. It is detailed. Um, this particular image is the Norton Cannon area. And the exciting thing is that this area, by chance, the whole county, well, the whole of the Northwest, we got someone to crunch the data. Believe me, there's a lot of it. And they crunched the data and manipulated it. And what you can see here is the brown colour are the high points in it. That's uh, high up topographically, top of hills. Um, the kind of flat grey blue colour is the bottom. Um, and then you can see various coloured blue splodges. So what you've got are these very nice, lovely, round edges. Those are ponds mapped um, from satellite data. Uh, so we've taken a picture, uh, uh, gone down and gone, yep, yeah, that's a pond, draw the outline. Uh, that's a really useful way. Uh, with the advent of Google Earth and Bing Maps and various other things that everyone has on their laptops, phones and all the rest, um, we can see a lot of ponds. However, those photographs are merely a snapshot in time. Uh, they are whatever it was on the day that picture was taken. And if they're taken in the middle of summer and it's been a lovely dry summer, a lot of the ponds that we know about uh, dry up completely in summer. This is fantastic for great crested newts and other things. Uh, not so great if you're trying to spot ponds that might be there in winter. So there are other methods. One of them are ponds shown on the Ordnance Survey maps. Now they aren't based on just one lot of data, they're based on lots of visits uh, over long periods of times. They use aerial photos. They still don't get all the ponds, but they tend to show up more. And these are what we call these mid blue splodges. So you can see now that this one appears on one lot. These appear here, but aren't on the Ordnance Survey. And then the final way we found them is by having our wonderful volunteers, as Dave said, I think we trained 55, 56, and they literally, phoned us up, they emailed me, they said, I know these ponds, are they on your list? They look about right. 
um, and they find ponds that haven't been picked up before. Uh, so these nice round blue dots are actually ones that uh, volunteers did on one of the training days Dave mentioned. Um, and they don't show up on anyone else's maps, and yet you get there and they're definite ponds and they're there all the time. But they're not very deep. The vegetation isn't wildly different in terms of from a distance, it's not immediately apparent, um, and they just haven't been picked up. Um, so those combinations of having the volunteers go out and survey, being able to use this wonderful LIDAR data, it's made available by the Environment Agency, um, and they've made it all publicly available over the last couple of years. And although it doesn't cover the entirety of Herefordshire, it does cover a large amount in great detail. Um, and finally, get that combined with the Ordnance Survey means we can start to pick up a huge amount of information. Um, this particular map also shows one other feature which we're delighted to be able to use, which are these little wiggly black lines you can see around every one of these dots. Um, when we think of lakes, and if you think back to being taught about ponds and in fact rivers, we have what we call the catchment area. So all the rain that falls down, hits the ground in that area, will run downhill. Water is most of the time pretty lazy and only goes downhill. And that's the catchment for any individual pond. Um, when we talk about these, it's really hard to get an idea of what a catchment is. And you think in terms of big river valleys, but these ponds, even when they're quite large, tend to have catchments that are maybe only sort of, you know, 10 meters around the outside. We're not talking huge distances. And what's more, a lot of ponds often appear all in one field or two fields. And each one of those can have its own discrete little catchment. So what you do very close to these ponds can have a massive impact. Um, that's one of the defining features of a kettle hole pond is that they're an isolated feature. They're not connected to any kind of um, water course or ditch or anything else like that. Um, so what you've got is them coming through uh, and uh, they don't link up. So the way, way the rain falls in um, means that that's where all the waters come from. We do get some that have an aquifer fed. Um, so they've got water bubbling up. Dave mentioned one earlier. Um, occasionally they're perched which means that they're not, they're sit isolated. They can be up here and the water table down here. Um, so they can have a very different um, history. Um, so when you're looking at these on this map, that all looks very clear. However, if I show you the uh, hedge, I've lost it, it's disappeared. Hmm. I know, there it is. So this is exactly the same area overlain but this is just our aerial photo to show you how difficult this is to work out on the ground without the lidar we have got pond here pond here pond here and that patch of four blue dots are all inside that very rectangular well, not rectangular trapezoid field here um each one of those had a catchment area there's actually an empty catchment where there's a kettle hole but no pond it never seems to have formed a pond um and when you're on the ground, this picture doesn't show up just how subtle those uh, topographic changes are. But we're talking maybe as much as three feet between the top of the catchment and the bottom. In the field, that is a tiny amount and it's really subtle, especially once you've got a bit of long grass um, to get in the way. And this project's been really exciting because a lot of projects, the geologists work away and look at their things and the ecologists look at all the amphibians, reptiles and water beetles and get very excited. And it's not often that we get to work together so that I can suddenly start saying, hang on a minute, there's a thing just over the hill or, oh, that's why this is special and this would be special too. So the bringing together of all those different sources of data is very interesting. Uh, and it's pretty much unique to this project. Um, Dave mentioned the pond surveys. We had some fantastic volunteers last year uh, who came out and surveyed. So what we did was we wanted people, so we got a lot of ecologists and a lot of geologists, and we wanted to bring those skills together, uh, help people learn something about uh, the other side if they haven't done it before. And so we said that we took them to a site, this particular example you can see in front of you is the lawn pool at Moccas, but we went to lots of different ones. Um, and we showed them what the different maps would tell them. And when we got on the ground, we started to record what we could see. Um, they were fantastic because they came out in all sorts of weather. Um, you can see from this picture, those are a lot of people looking really, really wet. It rained solidly for three hours. We were soaked um, and they were still smiling. 
Uh, the sun came out, which really makes you sh it really made a mockery of how wet we were. Um, we equally had fantastic volunteers who on several days last year came out and surveyed in 30 degree plus heat. Um, it's really hot surveying in 30 degrees, it turns out. Luckily, not a lot of, um, high, lot of movement required. So what we do is we turn up, we look at the maps, we look at the historic maps, because if a map is, a pond is marked in the first edition, it's probably uh, at least 100, 150 years old, which is a good start. We look at these idea with the LIDAR maps, the map you can see in the middle, you can see an awful lot of orange contours. Um, if you're familiar with uh, normal ordnance survey maps, that may make it look like you've got to climb up a mountain at the side of this pool. If you haven't, it's actually very flat, um, it's just that those are 10 centimetre contours, which really allows us to look all the way around the outside of that pond and spot whether there's any water coming in. Is there a drain? Is there a ditch? Is it linked to a man-made feature? Quite often on the ground, these are very hard to spot, but the LIDAR picks up the subtleties brilliantly. Um, we might look at the aerial photos there, also really useful, especially in kind of when you're on the ground working out what's where and what's around you and getting an idea of what is within that particular pond's catchment. Um, when we're at the ponds, we take lots of different measurements. Um, so our wonderful volunteers, uh, they used to take an auger out um, to see what they can see under the ground. Are we finding peat? Uh, that's the thing that I get really excited about because where we find peat, we stand the best chance of finding mammoths, none so far, but we keep looking. Um, you might hear it mentioned, you see a lot of mammoths in our publicity and it all looks like we're just kind of pitching in on some kind of possible, but it is possible. Uh, up in Shropshire and Condover, they found within the centre of a kettle hole, the remains of four, maybe five uh, mammoth skeletons. So I live in hope we could find a mammoth. Um, we might not find a mammoth, but we will find lots of other exciting things. When we all go down, um, and we trained everyone to use an auger, to dig down and to learn to identify what you're looking for. Peat's really exciting because it contains um, unrotted organic matter. And that means we can possibly pick up dates so we can know how long the pond has been a pond or at least is having material gather in. And if we get layers, as you can see in this image, um, you might be able to pick up changes in habitat. So what pollen has blown in from the surrounding areas? Are we finding pollen associated with cold periods, warm periods? Um, you will actually pick up if you've had big burning events. You can uh, start picking up when agriculture first kicks in in the more recent times. Pollen is a fantastic way for us to find out what has happened for, because these ponds are incredibly old, 10, 12,000 years. So you're really picking up about our history. Um, so where we find peat is very exciting. Um, you can see Will with glasses on his head there looking very closely at almost certainly a water beetle. Um, they don't have a nice life. When Will finds them, he pickles them and identifies them. It's very important work, but I always feel really sorry for them. Um, uh, you notice oh. at the bottom, we've got some fantastic volunteers. Uh, these are people learning how to do chemical testing. We test for phosphates. We test for electrical conductivity. Um, we're looking to see what the pH is. Um, this isn't just about finding out whether the water is clean and pure. One of the things is that although you might have a field or a small farm, which could have 20 ponds in, um, because each one of these is its own little discrete basin and isn't attached, they often tend to have their own water characteristics because of what's happened and what is coming into them. And this is quite a good way of working out whether they're linked or not, because it is quite difficult to work out what's going on underground. Um, and because uh, we like to see what's actually in the pond, although our volunteers don't tend to get in the water, Will never skimps on a chance to leap in in his waders um, uh, and have a look. We record what you can see in terms of what kind of aquatic vegetation can you see? Is it emergent? Is it submerged? Um, we help people learn to look at diversity. Um, I would say that as a geologist, and I'm really not very good at the ecological side, um, that's why we are lucky to have Will and Giles, um, we get people to look for diversity. This isn't about being able to identify any individual species, just saying it's got lots of different species. I don't need to know what A, B and C are, I just need to know whether there's 10 types of things or 50. Um, and in these ponds, I know uh, one of the ones we recorded, we recorded over 80 different species, which is a fantastic result. And it was a pond that we hadn't visited till this project came along. 
Um, so what we do is we give people a wonderful survey form. Uh, if any of my volunteers are in, we've asked everyone what they thought of the form and there has been some feedback and they don't look like this anymore. We've moved pictures around and rejigged it to make it more user friendly. As Dave said, we were able to do a development phase. And one of the things there was we developed a form just for us because there aren't forms for recording Ice Age ponds. And we needed that mix of biodiversity and geodiversity. So we created our own form, but it was a development stage. We were learning. We listened to what people said because they were using them uh, and we've changed it about a bit since. Um, we gave them a big handbook. We went out. We did a training day in a village hall. Uh, we're now doing it online. Um, and then we went out into the field and everyone got a chance to practice all these different bits of technology, having a go with an auger, learning and in an ability to question people and say, how do I know it's a this or what is that? So that people can get a feel for what we've done out there uh, and really practice it before we send them loose into the wilds of Herefordshire, finding fantastic ponds for us. Um, here's some of our volunteers using an auger. Um, it's hard work is what I would say. A lot of fun, very exciting. We found peat and I got really excited. I dragged people back to see the peat. Um, as you can imagine, when you've got a five page form and we've got 55 volunteers recording, we got a lot of data. We actually managed to survey 55 sites in great detail. Um, volunteers tend to work together in teams, uh, which is why there's slightly fewer sites than there are people. Um, but the amount of detail was phenomenal. We were able to talk about what we'd seen, um, what kind of percentage of cover was there, was it covered in trees, was it covered in aquatic vegetation, huge amounts of data, an enormous spreadsheet, um, which helps us then go back and, as Dave said, we produce some detailed management plans. We start to be able to say which sites have got either need work doing to them or in an area that would really benefit from having work done to them. Because if there's lots of really good ponds around it, doing that pond would help really increase um, and this data over what is a tiny proportion of the number of sites available to us has really helped with that. Um, now, as everyone will be aware, because we're doing this virtually, uh, this year has not gone according to plan. Uh, we would have intended in March to be going out, training our old volunteers again, getting all sorts of new volunteers out and doing more of these detailed surveys. Instead, we all stayed at home. But I knew that there was a way that people could carry on because I met lots of our volunteers, they were dead keen and they love maps and I'm a fan of maps. And someone we've been working with said, have you looked at the first edition maps? They've got a lot of ponds on them. And I thought, oh, that's a good point. Uh, as Dave showed you that 1940s fly, uh, aerial photo compared with now, you can see that a lot of ponds have been lost. So I put a little call out to all the volunteers and said, Does anyone love maps? I've got a job you can do from home and five of them with endless bags of patience sat and looked at them. They went through the first edition ordnance survey maps and pinpointed every pond they could see within the project area with a little dot and a grid reference and they gave me all those grid references. Hours and hours of work. Um, what that made me think was well if I know that they were there in 1880s and we know it's not flawless. We know that there'll be ponds that were missed off that definitely existed. And we know that there's ponds that were on there that maybe were in the wrong place. We can't prove that they were absolutely right, but it's the best we've got. Um, we were able to get an idea of how many ponds were around in the 1880s. It depends exactly where you were in Herefordshire as to which year they were done. And that identified about 1300 ponds. Bearing in mind, we would so far only identified about 60. Um, this was a little bit of work to do. Uh, as we're all aware, we're still not going out, we're still not surveying in the way we would have liked to. So we said, well, okay, now that we know that there's potentially ponds that were there 150 years ago, is there a way we can find out how accurate that is? And are those ponds still there? So we got our volunteers and we gave them a new uh, pond survey form. So, this is our area of interest. I don't know if you can see the red grid squares. Each one of those squares is actually based on the Ordnance Survey grid squares. We haven't done anything fancy. And I would send a volunteer them. They're five kilometers by five kilometers. And I'd send them the map. I send them a modern map and a first edition map. And I would say, off you go. 
if you can find a public right of way, be it a road you can walk beside and gaze over the hedge, a public footpath, a bridle way, open access land, anytime you can see a dock, go and have a look and fill in a really simple questionnaire. Um, on this map, I'm hoping that the symbols are different enough. I do realise that we print these out to be map sized, so when you see them in person, but you've got red diamonds, those are ponds that we know exist because the Ordnance Survey have mapped them. I admit, data's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And then you get these stars down here, uh, here. Um, ooh, back. Uh, I've leapt. I don't know how I leapt so far back. So where you get these little black stars, those are stars that we know existed on the first edition Ordnance Survey map. You also get symbols which are black stars with red diamonds on top. Those are ones that we think are still there. So what we said to all our volunteers was, and quite a lot more volunteers have come forward, if you're twiddling your thumbs, I've still got a few spaces that need doing. Um, so volunteers went out in their household bubbles and they're still doing it now. And they walk along the public rights of way uh, on nice sunny days. All the photos I've seen, they've picked lovely days to go out. Um, and they walk along them and they just say, is it a pond? Can I see a pond? Can I see a clump of trees? Is it hummocky? And as I said, we knew about 60-ish ponds. We now know of at least 1,300. This particular grid square, we sat and did a little bit more number crunching. Um, we reckon that if this is accurate and all the ponds that were first edition have indeed been lost, then we can say that it looks like it's a lot, that accuracy of, we've lost about a third of the ponds in the last 150 years. Now I can't guarantee that every number is accurate and every pond is properly recorded, but that's a large amount of ponds to have lost, um, especially when you think that they managed to survive for the 10, 12, 18,000 years before that. Um, so we've sent our volunteers out doing a nice socially distanced recording. So far, I've had about 150 pond spots recorded. Um, it will be a little while before I'm able to do the number crunching. But one of the things Dave said is that we talk about percentages and roughly 25% of ponds are natural and things. And we're hoping um, with this particular project, which we had never intended to do, we'd always much rather be outside working with volunteers um, because it's a very social thing to do and we like working with volunteers and these ponds are exciting and nice places to be. Um, but we can't at the moment. So this really was a last minute decision, but we're hoping to be able to come up with some quite interesting statistics to back up the idea that not only are these ponds rare, except in Herefordshire where it turns out they're 10 a penny, um, but we're losing them very quickly and they are worth protecting. So our detailed surveys are giving us the information about what we're finding in them. And these walking surveys covering a much, much larger area are able to say this is what's there now. And that information just hasn't been available before. So it is quite exciting that that's what we're learning. And I hope in about a year's time to be able to come back with some interesting statistics. And with all this wonderful data, we are now saying, hey, the volunteers come back and go, oh, you've got to visit this area. Here's some pictures, you'll love it. Uh, and next year, when we will hopefully be back again in the field, mapping with volunteers, we will have a more focused way to look for new sites. So Dave, management plans. Okay, as I said, um, 15 of these plans were drawn up for um, a number of, for um, se carefully selected um, ponds. This one, that's what the front cover looks like. It, the sort of information that was gathered, this is a typical species list, uh, and that is quite an impressive species list from um, the Lawn Pool at Mockers Park. Again, see there's one, two, three, four, five quite rare species and 32 in total. And that was just the water beetles. And so there's a lot of information gathered about each one. And each one has a, um, a map drawn. This is the, the actual ma management recommendations. So it's talking about which trees to uh, repollard and which trees to, to fell. Um, and the aim being essentially to open up these ponds which have been largely neglected. We'll see some photos of this one later on. Um, this is the very same. This is, um, this is Blake Mere, uh, Mere Pool. Um, and this is a section of that previous one. Let me go back. Um, this is this bit here. 
called the horse pond. Um, and it looks like that now because we've um, coppiced uh, a lot of the trees around it. So that now that the light can get to it, you can actually see very clearly the, the sort of um, um, uh, um, the, 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 the material that's, that's in the moraine of underneath the glaciers. So there's a, a variety of, um, of sizes and shapes of these, of these boulders in a, in a clay matrix, sand, a clay and sandy matrix. So that's a, um, that's a result of um, essentially doing, this, doing the survey, writing up the management plan, talking to the landowners, getting them to agree that um, uh, agree that the management explaining to them why we want to do this um, and these particular people at, um, at Blake Mere are wonderful very very careful custodians of their land um, and we're very happy to to uh, realize that what we're actually doing is acting like like beavers in in keeping these ponds open that have actually because of the lack of grazers and, and management of have gradually closed over and a, a lot of uh, a lot of the wildlife value of the, the aquatic habitat has, was beginning to disappear. These are some of the, the very old pollards and they're not hugely old because they're very quick growing. These are crack willows and the, they the, because they were hadn't been pollarded for, for some years they were beginning to to fall apart. Now we, we're employing a very um, a very knowledgeable and careful contractor and where he saw evidence that there might might be um, uh, bat habitat he's left the limbs on so one or two of them have got quite large uh, limbs still left on that's probably because there was a, um, a a nice sort of fissure in it to that may, may provide a, a roosting site for a bat and this is another pond where we've done some work on this. It's the southern side of it, um, coppicing a lot of um, crack willow. And this is sort of halfway through the operation because a lot of these large pollarded um, crack willows were pollarded by the end of this project, by the end of this, this particular contract. So, um, Sorry, that one wasn't supposed to be there. Another thing we're doing in um, in the project is to recreate some former kettle holes, which have actually been filled in. This is an example. Not, I don't think this one's in Herefordshire. I think this, this one is probably in in um, in Norfolk. Um, and but we're doing a very similar thing in that we're we're going to be carefully excavating what we think is an old kettle hole to to deepen to deepen it to provide. Um, two new ponds and we're going to hopefully be doing be doing this on the sturts. A very important apart from the fun things of seeing um, habitats being managed and, and opened out, a hugely important part of the project is telling people about this this about Ice Age ponds. That's the one of the biggest parts uh, uh, um, uh, one of the most important parts of this project. Um, so a number of uh, uh, ways of telling people. So one of them is the, um, the self-guided trails, um, which will be available through leaflets and the app, which you'll see later. Um, a geocache, we've actually, I've actually got somebody interested in helping to set out a geocache trail, which if you're, if you're, um, if you've never heard of them before, basically people that are keen to to follow trails with their, their with their um, uh, with their GPS machine, and then find um, carefully placed caches, and then when they basically get to them and they find some information, and then report that. It's it's a strange hobby, but some people like doing it. Um, we're going to be producing some new interpretation boards at sites where the public have access to these. It's unfortunately very limited, uh, limited number of sites. Um, so most of them will be on Herefordshire Wildlife Trust reserves, but if we can find um, a private landowner that's willing to have an interpretation board close by telling people about their Ice Age pond, then we'd be very happy to hear from them. Um, we are, we've produced a, a pond management leaflet. Um, there's a lot of, if you go to the, the trust website, there's quite a lot of information up there already. Um, we'll be producing a, 
an Ice Age pond booklet, which uh, tells the story of Ice Age ponds and uh, uses a few examples to, to tell people about more detail about the, uh, the, the wildlife and geology of Ice Age ponds. Um, we've done a few community events and activities, but um, in the development stage, but we'd like to do a few more um, when um, the time is right. And we're very keen to, to do that and looking forward to doing that next spring and summer, hopefully. And at the end of the, the project, we'll be holding a conference, um, probably at uh, Worcester universities to share a lot of the information and the knowledge that we've gained over the, over the period. Education is the, a crucial part of it as well. I think um, we've got a, one of the logos that's on the beginning of this slide is uh, for, for the um, Kingspan Trust, uh, Kingspan Community Trust, um, and they have provided um, a serious amount of money to enable our um, engagement team or the education team to go to schools in the area to, uh, to teach kids about the importance of ice age ponds in their area and generally about wildlife uh, and that's always a very rewarding experience. Some of you may have already been to the exhibition in Hereford Museum. Um, Beth and I spent uh, an interesting day bringing that mammoth um, in the back of a Luton to up into the, the museum and erecting it there. Um, there's, an awful, there's a lot of information on, on with one, one section of the, um, the Ice Age exhibition in Hereford, Hereford Museum is devoted to Ice Age ponds. And there's lots of related information uh, such as the, um, this, um, ice, this um, hand axe, which was actually found in near Kington, probably very close to one of our Ice Age pond sites. And an awful lot of information there as well. And we're also having family uh, education activities and they've been, been very successful so far. So groups of up to five, I think families of up to five going along and, um, and having a, a nice age pond experience for, for a few hours. <clears throat> this is the app and this is, this is where we are at the moment with it. Uh, this is actually on my phone. It's very much in trial at the moment. Um, we're still developing the uh, landscape tour and the, the two different trails. So there's there's a, a landscape cook to a landscape tour which we you can do by car or by bike. And there are two trails: one at the Sturts Nature Reserve and one at Birch's Farm near uh, near Kington, um, where you can follow. You can uh, pick up virtual information. You can do it from from your from your own home, or you can actually follow it in the field if you download it beforehand. Once that is in a state where we um, where we need to test it, it's actually still being developed um, at the moment. But once we've got it to a stage where uh, what we'd like to do next is to then send it out to people to to test it and give us feedback on it, so we can improve it even further. Management guidance for landowners is a, is a crucial part of this because a lot of these ponds are on privately owned land. Um, they're on intensive farmland sometimes. Um, our experience so far is a lot of landowners are very, very keen to, to know and understand about the, the importance of the ponds and are very keen to, to um, um, and willing to, to help to, to preserve them. So one of the things we'll be doing in the next month or so, Beth, I and the, um, the team will be doing a, a seminar aimed at the land advisors, people from Natural England and from the local authority that go out and talk to landowners and farmers about the various grants and um, things that are available to, to help landowners manage their land. What we're trying to do is raise their awareness of the importance of these, of these Ice Age ponds and why they're so special and what one can do to ensure that they, that they continue to be valuable habitats. The, this, this is quite a long document as it stands, but we're gonna do a summary of that so that landowner advisors can, can take them out to, to landowners. Another thing we've been doing, again, raising awareness, we were filmed at um, Croft Castle um, doing, a, doing a survey that's Will in, in his element there, paddling around in, in, um, in a pond. Um, and Giles in the bottom left-hand corner. So we were all, uh, we all said about um, 
about a, a minute or so's worth of uh, summarised information about the, pond, the, the, the project and it went out at lunchtime and tea time, uh, which hopefully quite a few people saw. We've also had an article in The Guardian, which came out um, three or four weeks ago online and in the, in the Saturday paper. Um, I'm hoping we've got a copy of that or a link to that on the website, which you can go and read, quite an interesting article. So this was at, at um, Marcus Park um, um, and the, the journalist came and, and talked to Ian there, who's, who's um, talking about the geology there and Will um, was talking about the ecology and I was um, talking about the importance of the, of the general conservation generally. So what do we need to do next? Um, well, Beth talked a little more about um, the, the surveys, the walking surveys that she, she's initiated. So we'll be doing a lot more of those. We'll be carry out, carrying out more detailed surveys like the ones we carried out last year with a target of, of 60. Um, so that's again, taking out the, the um, hopefully with volunteers, taking out those survey forms, filling them in, creating lots of data. Um, this data will be used to, to inform the conservation of these ponds in the future. Pond management, the, 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 um, we've started this already, but the management plans that were put together last year, we've begun to carry out the management recommendations on, on the 15 ponds that have been targeted. We've got quite a few volunteers already but we'd love to to, to uh, recruit more and train more volunteers to be to be pond champions. Now if you know anybody, if anybody would like to, um, to contact us about being a pond champion, what we want them to do with various roles, we could have say a, a, a landowner that has ponds on their land and is quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about about Ice Age ponds and would in the future like to be a point of contact for people to, um, to, to be shown Ice Age ponds or to talk to somebody who manages an Ice Age pond. So that's one kind of role um, and there are other obviously lots of other roles people uh, people who live in parishes that know of particular ponds that would be interested perhaps in in helping to continue to survey ponds in their local area, or even uh, get trained up to lead a, a work party to, to continue management, management of the pond into the future. So it's part of our the legacy of trying to um, get people to, to retain an interest in looking after these ponds. We will be this year writing five more detailed management plans, which can be um, carried out through various means into the future. So we're hoping that we'll, we will be able to um, encourage new landowners and new ponds to manage their pon ponds in accordance with these management plans that we're writing. The analysis of the data, which Beth has alluded to earlier on, um, there's a lot of it and it's got probably some very useful information it, once it's put together analyzed and summarized there we're hoping that we can actually put out some some um, very interesting information about that um, and part of what i've been talking about is is the the um, improved protection that hopefully will come about by we're talking to the landowner advisors they are going to um, um, trans transfer their our information their information and knowledge to landowners who look after these ponds. That's one sort of protection. Um, it would be very nice to think that there would be some sort of statutory protection to some ponds, but unfortunately at the moment that's unlikely. So the protection is more likely to come from both landowners and local people caring and understanding about the importance of them so that they want to look after them. Uh, and that's probably the best way of ensuring the, the long-term protection of, of this sort of species, this sort of um, habitat. Just a quick one to show you some of the team, uh, hard working behind the scenes, some people. Um, this is uh, Richard King from, he's the chairman of, of Hampshire Amphibian and Reptile Team. That's Giles there who works with Will. Um, so th these are the heart, this is the heart team, the heart of the project. That's Professor, Pro Professor um, Ian Fairchild. 
uh, who's uh, an expert on the geological side of things and um, is uh, based at uh, Worcester University. Andrew Nixon, who works for Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, he was very involved in putting the original application together and has worked tirelessly to, to make this thing happen. That's Beth sitting down in the foreground and me on the left. Um, and of course, we couldn't do this without huge numbers of great volunteers. So thank you for listening. Um, it's been very enjoyable running through this again, and it's also very interesting listening to, to Beth's um, more uh, knowledgeable um, description of the, of the geology. I'm, I will try and remember some of that next time. So I'll put this up in while we're um, taking questions, um, and it's got the the, um, <clears throat> the website that you can go to for more information. Um, you can also register there and in and get involved a bit more in the project, either now or in future. Um, there's also a little slot there where you can donate to the project. Um, and that's my email address there. We should have put Beth there, but I, if you send an email for any more information to that email address, I can always pass it on if I think Beth will have a better answer. So thank you very much. And uh, do we have any questions? Not sure how we do this, but I think you have to unmute yourself and shout basically. <clears throat> Or you can type in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Yo, start video. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello, David and Beth. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes can. Well, thank you so much. That's fascinating. I'm a newcomer to Herefordshire, having only moved here over the last few months. That was really interesting. Um, so congratulations on your wonderful project. Um, I'm wondering about palynology. Uh, have you included, you've mentioned obviously pollen cores as part of your presentation, Beth. Have you done pollen diagrams as part of your studies? Or do you intend to? Do you have the resources to do that? And do you feel it would add anything to your current needs for this project? Um, yes, and yes, and yes. So <laughs> there is very little data for Herefordshire kettle holes, despite the fact that we keep saying that there seem to be a remarkably large number. It's as if Herefordshire gets missed off the map quite often. Um, and uh, people haven't done much research here. Uh, the few ones that had been done made it sound like Herefordshire was incredibly interesting, which makes it even stranger that nobody had done any research. Um, we were really lucky in that um, Ian, uh, as Dave mentioned, is a professor at, uh, emeritus at Birmingham, and we had two students from Birmingham and a student from Aberystwyth come and join us uh, last year. And we took them, uh, amazingly, as Dave talked about losses, um, a lot of the sites, the two key sites that had been researched, are no longer available uh, because they've been dug up. Uh, one of them is now a big fishing lake, so one of the sites that we had firm dates and beautiful pollen diagrams uh, done about 20 years ago for is now a big fishing lake. Another one was dug up to improve drainage in neighbouring fields, destroying all the kind of, although there's probably still some of the peat there, none of these eight and ten metre cores uh, are, are obtainable again. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do was we went out, we found a fantastic site because of our training, someone came on and went, well, I've got a farm and it's got these wonderful, uh, we, we put a digger in to make it a bit deeper and the digger nearly got lost. And we all went, can we come and have a look? Uh, and found a fantastic peat core. Uh, and one of the students from Birmingham University was able to get some pollen out of it and has created some pollen diagrams for us. Okay. Uh, this was an undergraduate uh, piece of research, but it's a nice bit that he's done. Um, we did try and find uh, Pete on several other sites, despite the fact the geological maps map it as being in loads of ponds, we actually really struggled to find peat in uh, enough quality and quantity uh, on sites where we've got permission from landowners, um, certainly within the de development phase. Um, and we tried and on a couple on one site we thought we might manage to have enough, but the pollen just wasn't preserved to a high enough degree. So we are trying. Within this project though, uh, I don't think it came up in this, we do actually have a budget 
to provide bursaries to students to come and do research in our area to help them cover the costs of coming into Herefordshire uh, and staying here and doing the research. And we had hoped that we might find someone who was interested. Um, but with everything that went on this year, uh, most universities uh, completely stopped all field work this summer and it's not clear whether there will be any field work allowed next summer because of the amount of planning, but we are hopeful. So yes, we would like some more pollen research done. Um, we don't have the resources ourselves uh, to do it. Um, I personally do not have either the skill or patience. I have done it in my past and, and I'm not patient enough for it. It requires a great deal of skill. Um, but we do have access, um, usually if we uh, coerce, persuade, beg, um, to get people to either lend us the equipment or bring in their technicians, that's what we did last year. Uh, and if we find sites, one of the reasons we get our volunteers to auger looking for peat is not because we think our volunteers will suddenly go, hang on a minute, I know what this pollen is. It's because if they find peat, we can then go, okay, we need to bring some experts in with some bigger and more uh, useful equipment to take proper cores. Um, we are hopeful that we will keep finding sites which have peat in or one or two and that people will be able to do more research on them. So yes, and if you happen to be really keen on palynology, then uh, send me your email address and I will be sending you stuff because while we won't be doing it, as I say, uh, it's a, a, a fantastic skill but requires huge amounts of patience and we are hopeful um, that we'll be able to get something next year, um, but at the moment not so much. So yes, we have done some, uh, yes, it would be useful and yes, we want to do some more. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. That's very interesting and very comprehensive. <laughs> and, um, I mean, certainly it's generally archaeological, I gather. Uh, you know, um, archaeology is the main interest for palynology is in my limited experience as an amateur. Um, but I just I was just interested in whether or not it could be part of your story. Oh, yes. It, it in ours, we, they were using it, we, we did have some budget for radiocarbon dating, but unfortunately weren't able to get samples to do it, because um, obviously they have to be collected in a certain way and be in a certain state. Um, but yeah, we can use it to recreate the climatic history of certainly the last 11 or 12,000 years. Yes. Um, there is some argument as to how accurate it was, but um, that's to do with the way pollen grains spread over a large area rather than the process of collecting them themselves. We never know, I might put my hand up sometime to give it a Brilliant, try. drop me a line. I'm always keen to have people who like looking at pollen. Got your, got your name now. Got, got your name now, Rosie. Thank you. <laughs> Going through this chat, um, to Chris, who said that the Liverpool Uni used to send their students. I didn't know that. Um, there is... I know that there's no, there was no BGS map for the area in north, the very, very northwest. It's actually slightly further north than our Herefordshire. It is the Knighton area, um, although that is being rectified by an amazing team of volunteers um, doing something called the Knighton Mapping Project. Um, however, now that I know a load of students have been out, I feel I might get, get in touch with one of the people I know at Liverpool Uni and say, any chance of looking at those undergraduates? So thank you for mentioning that. Um, I, I honestly, I didn't know they sent them. I can see why Hereford is a lovely place to do mapping. Um, well, yes, I, I, th I think actually um, they, they, it was actually around Kington as well. And, and apparently there were quite a lot. It was, a, you know, a, the a second, third year dissertation that they were do, doing. Uh, and um, uh, the, man, the man was, the, 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 the chap in charge was Jeff somebody. I can't remember the other, this other name at the moment. It's the kind of thing you can usually find out. Um, but yes, if, if anyone's interested, uh, the Team Valley Geological Society are doing something called the Night and Mapping Project. It is a work of art and I really hope that uh, it's worth following. They are fantastic patients going out and mapping it. It's hard to believe in this day and age that part of our country has never been geologically mapped. We did all the first maps, William Smith and his work, and since then we just missed a bit that covers the very northern part of Herefordshire and the very southern part of Shropshire. It is criminal, but they are producing fantastic work and hand painting their maps, which is, I can't describe it, beautiful. <laughs> I'm going down through these. Um, so, Graham, uh, has asked about great crested newts near Bodenham. Um, just having great crested newts does not mean you have an ice age pond. Um, but 
it's always really nice to find. Um, they are very exciting to have. Um, where, what we tend to find in Herefordshire, although I freely admit being the geologist, this isn't my field, is that it, in sites um, that are kettle holes, these natural ponds, um, they tend to find phenomenal numbers. I know because we were having a conversation with the ecologist this morning, they were saying on one of them, they found 282 uh, great crested newts within one pond. Um, so these numbers are phenomenal. And although there are lots of places where you find them, uh, it's a good indicator of a really high uh, value pond. Um, it doesn't mean that exclusively Ice Age ponds are where you find them. Uh, Boddenham, I would say, is right on the edge um, and might be slightly too far over to have an Ice Age pond. But if you do want to get in touch and give me a grid reference, I do tend to check these things because I'm always keen to find new ponds we can come and visit. Um, I see that the, the, the project's got as far as Spain. That's good, isn't it? Tenerife. Um, so the next question was Helen Stace. I said there's a lot of pollen data from Lawn Pool. Um, yeah. I didn't, uh, I, we have got quite a lot of data on that. Um, Lawn Pool is a really interesting site and is one of the places in Herefordshire that has been researched. Um, as I said, it's surprising that so few have been looked at because when they have looked, they've always been really interesting. Um, and yeah, Natural England have got a lot of the information. One of the problems for our project is getting hold of the unstudied cores and things. We've, you ask everyone and nobody seems to know where they are. They'll be in a box somewhere, in a cold room, hopefully. Um, but Birmingham Uni have been really supportive of the project and we are still working with them. Um, mm. But uh, also one of the things is it's slightly uh, matching up a student who wants to do the study uh, and somewhere they can study and a piece of research that meets the criteria uh, for being an undergraduate project has been difficult, um, especially this year. Last year we seemed to do really well. This year we've been struggling to get out there and find someone. Uh, but I know that given everything going on, there's a lot of other things on people's minds. You're, uh, from Viv and Ant talking about uh, lived in Mockers 20 years, garden full of crested newts. Fantastic. That's a lovely thing to find. Um, I, I mentioned that there were three types of Ice Age ponds and Dave was talking about these ones within a glacier. They form a fantastic ring all the way around the hillside around Moccas and Bredwardeen and all the way along that valley and uh, Blakemere, uh, right the way round. Uh, and all of them are mapped as containing peat. And uh, several of us, I think there was about 12 of us, went out with an awful lot of kit to call this peat, could find none of it. Uh, I'm determined this time that we will get out and find it. Uh, and maybe find that mammoth that I hold out all my hope for. Mm. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, gone quiet. We have been talking for quite a while. I reckon people yeah, are possibly. I think everybody wants to go and have some tea. <laughs> should we should we call it a day then? Thank you everyone for, for coming and listening to the talk. And uh, as I say, go to please do go to the website um, and do get in touch if you want to. Um, either for more information or <clears throat> or want to get involved with the project. Was that another chat? Was it? Oh. All right. Okay. Right. I think Francis has the um, Francis has the button to switch us all off. So um, I shall hand over to her. Oh, I think we've got. I think we've got one more question from Anne. Oh, no. Anne, would you like to go ahead? It's not a question, it's just a big thank you from um, us at the Hereford uh, City Branch of the Wildlife Trust, just to say it's been brilliant and wonderful talk. And um, I, I missed the first one and I'm so glad that I was able to catch up with this one. And i um, glad, Francis, that you're recording it so we can send it out or hopefully, and other people can um, enjoy it as well. Thank you, it was great. Great, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you all soon. Right. Bye. Bye.